Hello, friends. Welcome to the Nexus Podcast. I'm your host, James Dice. Each week, I fire questions at the leaders of the smart buildings industry to try to figure out where we're headed and how we can get there faster without all the marketing fluff. I'm pushing my learning to the limit, and I'm so glad to have you here following along. Episode 62 is a very enlightening conversation with John Clark, head of smart building technology at Dexis, one of the largest real estate developers, owners, and operators in Australia. We talked about John's long and successful career in smart building technology, or building technology as he would call it, and what he's learned from seeing it from all sides, the contractor side, the consultant side, and now the customer side. Then we took a bit of a deep dive into Dexis's smart buildings program, where it's headed. Lots of parallels with recent owner side episodes with Google and Nuveen. Without further ado, please enjoy Nexus Podcast episode 62. All right, hello, John. Welcome to the Nexus Podcast. Can you introduce yourself? So I'm John Clark, and I'm the um, head of smart building technology at Dexas, is based in Sydney, in Australia. Cool. And I'm excited to to talk about all of your of your vast experience in the industry today. Um, let's start with your background. How'd you get to Dexas? Uh, and you can start as early as you'd like. Oh wow. Um, well, I'm a bit of a dinosaur, I think, in the, in the industry. Uh, started in the, in the early 80s, actually, in, um, in Petrochem. So I've always been in um, automation, instrumentation, and integration, if you like. And it was pretty sophisticated even back then for process, I guess. Um, and through just a, you know, a number of things, through redundancy, I fell into buildings in kind of probably yeah, around about the late 80s. And back in the day, it was all very analog, proprietary, modular, vendor driven, manufacturer driven, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say it's a bit of a culture shock because I've gone from systems that were very fast, quite sophisticated to systems that were quite slow. Yeah. And, and, and the thing that there was, the three principles that I'd been trained on were about safety, obviously first, reliability and then efficiency. And those kind of things went out the window when I, when I got, got into buildings. <laughs> it's just a different, it's a completely different game, right? So yeah, so I was a service tech for a, for a few years for, a, for an independent company. Okay. And then started my own integration company as a subcontractor in, I think it was 91. Okay. Yeah. So and that was on the industrial side or that was on the building side? No, that was on the building side. Okay. Yeah. So I was only in industry for about five or six years and then when it went to buildings. But that five, six years of training was unbelievable. Yeah. Like the, okay. the way it, it makes you think very, very differently. And I think you bring that with you throughout your whole career. You know, it's kind of it's in your mind now. Yeah. Why do you think the industrial side is, or at least was back then, ahead of things on the building side? It's the it's the value of what you're doing. If you think about if you think about the value of oil and the safety aspects around a refinery versus building automation, yeah. you know they're, they're they're worlds apart. So they had the money and the time to spend on the systems. Um, and again, about the reliability. If you had a, a plant that was offline for a couple of hours, you're talking of huge amounts of money. You know. Okay. And if you have a system that doesn't work very well, you've got life safety issues. So yeah, it's just a very, very different environment. Totally. So yeah, it all goes back to money, I think. Yeah, <laughs> fortunately or unfortunately. Um, yeah. Okay, so you had your own in integration firm, and then what was after that? I was really lucky. I I started working for one of the chiller main chiller manufacturers who were just starting out on chiller sequencing and energy efficient chiller controls. Cool. Okay. So I started doing some very early integration for those guys with a company. There was a company a bit like um, Tridium in the UK that used to do integration drivers. Okay. So we would, we would help the company integrate their chillers into the building management systems and, and all that sort of stuff. So I did that for quite a number of years. Got to see some um, really quite amazing projects, um, pretty random ones, where chillers are required. And then dot-com came along in the, in the mid-90s. And I pretty much was doing data center designs for, yeah, from probably about 94 through to about the early 2000s. It was, um, okay, everything was data center driven. And obviously the chilling refrigeration requirements of a data center is pretty phenomenal. So yeah, that was my world for quite a few years. And that was uh, an amazing learning curve, I have to say. Mm -hmm. Because not just about the HVAC systems, it took me back to my industrial process because it is almost like a process. Yeah. It has to be reliable and resilient. You know, you, you can't let these things fail. And then once you start looking in the white space, you see all the computer IT system, systems, you really get a bit of an insight into what's happening in the IT world at that time. Hmm. 
So that's when it really started. The OTIT bit started to come together, I think, in that sort of like mid nineties. Okay. All right. Do yeah. you think it was coming together in your mind or was it actually coming together in the industry as well? I think for those that were involved in data centers, they probably saw it. Mm -hmm. But for those that were just in HVAC and buildings, probably not. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Then what was next? Then I, I became the technical director of a larger company for, for seven years. Got involved in some really great projects, some pretty crazy ones as well. And, um, and then I realized what I was doing is I'm very much about um, practicality, execution, value. And I was spending a lot of my time doing things that were not really techie. They were more corporate focused, looking at um, finances. And I had a lot of staff and, you know, so I was like doing company stuff rather than the, the, the back to your tech stuff. So I started to kind of get a bit of itchy feet and I wanted to go back into the realms of getting a bit more into the tech again. Yeah. And then in 2008, very early, an opportunity came up to emigrate over to Australia from London. And, um, and I was a consultant until, until this role, yeah, until 20... 2019, 2018. Cool. Yeah, I've seen seen three sides, right? I've like been integrator, contractor, consultant, and now now client role. All right, two questions. You mentioned crazy projects. I need mm -hmm. some sort of example. Uh, what's the craziest project you did? I think it was for sort of British American tobacco. It was a tobacco drying plant in the middle of the um, southern Russian desert. It was in a place called Uzbekistan. <laughs> Actually, it's called Samarkand. Funny enough, I talked about it on one of my last few days of when I was with um, NDY. And I found it on, on, the, on the web. So I was talking to the engineers about what I did on that job. And it's still, you can still see it. But it was, um, so it's process control. Obviously, it was, you know, looking at drying tobacco. But it was just the environment. I mean, you know, you flew to Tashkent. You were about six hours in a four by four going across the desert to get to the site. There was uh, some pretty crazy individuals around you getting you there, making sure that you were safe. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Yeah, and then um, and then the actual process itself. Not that I'm an advocate of smoking, but it's very very complex the tobacco industry. Mm -hmm. And so the to, to get the humidity levels right and to get the tobacco right to roll into the cigarettes is a phenomenal kind of a, a process. Where it was so interesting was that we built packaged plant rooms in France in a factory in France. Okay, because they were so big they couldn't get them on the UK roads to then mm -hmm. get them to the port to get them to Europe. So there was a factory hired in France. We were there for probably about three months building these massive plant, um, plant rooms. Okay. And then they all got um, taken by truck down to the site. We thought that was the end of it until we got a call probably about six or seven weeks later saying that they'd been damaged and we just need to send a team in to see what the damage was um, like. Okay. And the damage was we almost had to rebuild the things again on site. So I had another crew go out for about 12 weeks to try and rebuild all the damaged systems. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Okay. Cannot imagine. I'm I'm from, you know, the almost middle of nowhere in the Midwestern United States. Uh, I've been to some really cool buildings, but that that sounds pretty awesome. So yeah, it's crazy. All right. Um, my other question was a little bit more detail on why why you left why you left London. I've traveled a lot. I've been really lucky that you know my first job I traveled quite a bit. I've always kind of like loved going to new countries and finding new things. And I got relations in Australia mm -hmm. and I've been over here and visited and I always kind of liked what it had to offer, but it was a long way away. Yeah. Yeah. I think the thing that got me was that it was what's next for me. And I have this thing where I don't like to be comfortable in my comfort zone for too long. Hmm. I always like to try and be slightly on the edge of my comfort zone. Yeah. I think it's the only way that you can kind of really progress and push yourself. Yeah. So when an opportunity came up, I just decided why not? And um, my family and myself moved out here. And to be honest with you, I haven't looked back. It's, it's home for us. It's, we love it here. And I think at the time, you know, the industry, I was probably pretty advanced in what we were doing compared to what the industry was doing here. So I was bringing uh, quite a lot of knowledge into, into the industry. And I remember one of the first projects I did actually for, for Dexas was to optimize one of their buildings. And the original plan was to rip out the BMS and, you know, um, some other works. But I kind of flicked it in its head and said, no, the BMS still got a lot of life left in it. Let's rewrite all the software algorithms. Hmm. And I rewrote it on, a, on a, an algorithm that's actually got like a voting pattern in it. Huh. Okay. Nobody had ever heard of it before. I, I didn't, I didn't um, create it. It's, it's come from another manufacturer. But um, I, I took the best of it. It's um, the Truman Respond principles. Yeah. And the neighbor's rating from that building went from, you know, two and a half star 
to 4.7. Mm -hmm. And then they then upgraded the chillers and we've got it to 5.2. But the you know the the big piece of the um of the action was actually in rewriting the software algorithm. Cool. So cool. yeah. And, and it's great to have, you know, they were very progressive. Dex has loved to try a few things out. And they just said to me, Well, you're you're the occupant of the building at the time. It was where our, our office was. Give it a go and let's see what we can do with this thing. And the result speaks for itself. So hmm. yeah. Really cool. And so what made you go from consulting and to working at, at Dexas? What was that transition like? I think it was a natural progression for me. I got to the point where I'd kind of done consulting long enough and I realized I wanted to do something else. Yeah. I think going back into either um, vendor or manufacturing world was kind of like going, going a bit backwards. So I think it was naturally the client role, I think, was a good fit for me. Mm -hmm. What I would say is having spanned these three major parts of the industry has given me a really good lens to understand the agendas and the complexities behind each of those yeah um so yeah it's like when i was a contractor i used to get a bit frustrated by some of the consultants decisions that's because i didn't realize what was happening in their world yeah and as a consultant the same sort of thing with clients making decisions you think oh i'm not sure but that's because again yeah. Now I've seen all three. I can see the whole picture. It all makes sense. And it is, it's, it's a really challenging industry, I have Absolutely. to say. A lot of contradictions and a lot of agendas and things that, you know, a lot of moving parts. Yeah. So I guess now it's given me the ability to work out what's the best execution plan for if we're going to roll out a tech in a building. And I understand I've got to get a contractor involved and a consultant and, I, and I've got a vision. How do I bring those three worlds together and actually realize it? All right, this is really rare that someone has these three perspectives. What would you say the different like mindsets of the three are and how, how do they differ? And then the second question is like, how do you, how do you bring those together? If, if there's a short answer to that. <laughs> um, okay, so it's quite an aggressive marketplace, right? Particularly um, the industry for bidding for work. So mm -hmm. the contractor really, if he wants to win the work, they're gonna do exactly what it says in the brief, if they can. Yeah. They need to be very careful if they offer more than the brief for obvious reasons. Yeah. So in their world, it's about what have I been asked to do? How can I price it up most efficiently and deliver upon it? And that's literally in, in, a, in a box. Yeah. In the consultant's mind, it's again about they've been given something to design, but they're designing against a timeline and a budget. <laughs> yeah. Right. So yeah. again, what can I do for my client in this time and in this budget? Yeah. And so that's how they're kind of, it's almost like, you know, they're passing the, the problems down to the contractor. And, <laughs> yep. and, and, from, and from the client's perspective, there's a big difference between an existing building retrofit and a new development, completely different process. In some aspects, a retrofit upgrade is easier to get the best results than a development project because there are, a, are less moving parts and contractual obligations. Hmm. There are less people in, in the chain. You know, I want you to replace a chiller, Consultant specs a chiller, contractor puts a chiller in. Very, very simplistic. But once yeah. you start to get into that development world, it's, well, we have a brief, we have a vision, this is what we want um, a builder to build for us. But there's a lot of parts in that about, you know, um, getting a design consultant to do a design to a certain, certain level. And then they hand the design over to the builder that's going to finish it. And if you think about the, the guys that are building it, they've got to price it again on a, a time, you know, a time frame, right? Because it's very, it's imperative that that building is occupied by a certain time. Yeah. The really big problem comes in is when you start to look at the technology or the bolt-on parts. Pouring the concrete and everything else is, is one thing. But once you start to go into technology and you've got a building that's not going to come out the ground for five years, how do you set your price now to win a job on something that may not be developed for five years' time? That's, yeah. that's the major challenge. And that's an industry challenge that we're all working through at the moment. Hmm. And the only way you can overcome that is by changing the process. It's not about the tech. It's about the process. It's about the people. So hmm. I think it's really important. that, and, and I guess having the three lenses helped me to put that together because I've got some IP on how those three operate. And it just means that the brief will be very, very different. The ones that you, that you guys write versus... Well, it's the brief and it's also the methodology behind it. Hmm. And that's a problem too, because if we can't tell a builder how to build. Yeah, right. So, so again, it's, yeah, it's putting together a very comprehensive strategy 
So I'm working through, you know, um, delivery strategies, procurement strategies, um, mm -hmm. new roles that are coming into the industry. Well, yeah, like I'd love to talk about that strategy a little bit more. Um, can you first talk about like what it, what is Dexus? What's the portfolio? How many buildings? What types of buildings? All that for people that don't know. Uh, yeah, sure. So look, uh, we're we're one of Australia's leading real estate groups. Um, we 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 manage and we own a pretty large portfolio. Um, we're Australia only, by the way, um, so we're nowhere else. Um, we own, I think it's about 15 and a half billion of office, industrial and, and healthcare. So we've recently gone into to healthcare properties. So we have quite a diverse asset class. And, um, and we manage about 21 billion um, for third parties as well. So that's a pretty big, pretty big organization across, you know, owned and operated. And then we've got a development pipeline, and you've probably seen some stuff in the news recently of the things that we're doing, about, about 11, 11 and a half billion that we've got pipeline at the moment. It's a pretty significant. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. then what, and look, what, we, we're in it for the long term. We don't kind of really build and, and sell. Okay. We kind of build, build to keep. Got it. Okay. And then what's what's your role? And then what does like the smart buildings team look like around you? I, I look at the strategy of how we roll out building technology. And let's just park the smart piece for the minute. It's actually building technology. Yeah. And that could be anything from a building management system, access control, you, you name it. So I've got, a, I've got a piece to play in how we procure and deploy those technologies. Okay. The team around me is made up of, I've got a guy that's um, come from the IT side of the, the industry. Okay. So he's got a really good handle on networking and security and connectivity. Mm -hmm. and his role is actually in the, um, his fundamental role is in the, what I call technology infrastructure. Okay. He looks at communications network, telecommunications, um, in building mobile coverage, all that side. Mm -hmm. Then I've got a technology analyst. And his role is that we get so many vendors approaching us with their you know, flavor of the day. Yep. Yep. So he is the gatekeeper, if you like. He, he, um, we have a bit of a, a way of um, registering what we look at. Okay. Um, whether it's got a use case and whether it goes to the next level of actually seeing a demo or whatever. So he, he does a lot of that. And he also helps out with some of our project stuff as well. Cool. And then I focus more on, yeah, the kind of I'm across a bit of everything really. But then we've also got a project delivery group. So when projects go live, they help us with the project management side of, side of it. Okay. Um, so there's okay. quite a lot of internal, internal um, stakeholders and, and there's, a, there's a big internal operations to be able to help us deploy projects, which is, which is good. Yeah. And then the team, I guess, sit in the center of operations and sustainability. You know, we, we, okay. we work very closely with the sustainability guys to help them with their targets and to, to enlighten them on which tech could help them out and how. Yeah. And then we also sit across the operations guys who are looking at doing um, refurbs and retrofits to help them out with like an internal consulting group, I guess. Yeah. It's interesting that you have an IT background on, on your team can you talk a little bit about that and why that is specifically but also there's something i forgot to ask you about which is your your shift from like this ot centric world into this it centric world and you said that came from one of your big consulting clients can you can you more elaborate more deeply on that you know when i was um an integrator you could see the it world starting to come into what we were doing we saw some very early adoptions of ip networking it was pretty primitive but it was ip Mm -hmm. And so you could kind of see the way the industry was going and it was more to do with about, so it was communications and remote connectivity. You could see they were the main things that were coming in to the industry. And then, and I think that product manufacturers were also starting to look at changing up their hardware to be more IP compliant and yeah. faster and more powerful systems. But one of the last the gigs that I had with NDY was consulting to a, a big, big tech, tech giant. And my role there was to help them understand building data sets, uh, what they could get out of buildings. And I remember having conversations where I was telling them about, you know, BACnet and how buildings worked and build BMS systems. And they were a bit shocked, <laughs> to be honest <laughs> yeah. with you. Yeah. By, uh, they were like, really? Are you sure? <laughs> but, you know, the other side of that, hearing about their world and understanding where they were coming from, it blew my mind. It was... It's such a different world and it's, it really opens you up to so much more power, scalability, um, ease of management. There's a phenomenal amount of benefits 
from embedding good IT practices into your uh, into the OT world at that at that enterprise layer. Hmm. So yeah, that was like three years where I was a sponge. I was just sucking up every minute I could yeah. of what was going on in their world. It was it was fascinating. So cool. uh, yeah. I think you and I maybe think similarly along the lines of like other building owners and operators are going to go in that direction as well. What do you think that's going to do to the industry? I think that what's going to happen is the demand is going to be reversed. At the moment, the demand has been vendor driven. If you, if you know, you've only got to get somebody that goes onto Google and types in smart buildings and you just see all of the amazing images that you get coming up and the cool tech and everything else. And they've all got, some sort of a, um, a problem to solve. Yeah. And I think that for a lot of building owners, they're not really sure they have those problems yet. <laughs> <All right? laughs> yeah. So it's very much industry driven that I've got something that's going to help you out. Yeah. And I think what's happening now, I think that from our perspective, we're seeing the power that data can provide at a corporate level. Hmm. And we're starting to realize actually, we need to be able to also use the data from buildings that we don't have at the moment. So I think. The, the building owners and operators are going to start to now demand new things. So I think those two worlds are going to come together. I think the vendors are going to start to create products that are more beneficial to the end user than where they think their products are beneficial. There's a lot of stuff out there that really is, you know, probably not going to help us out too much at the moment. Yeah. Oh, everyone knows my opinions on that. So that, that, that's, I think I agree with you. I think that's where we're headed as well. And I can't, honestly can't wait for it. Um, you know, when I talk to the, the similar tech minds that come from the IT world, I'm like, can you please keep educating people? <laughs> uh, so, yeah. yeah. So let's talk about the strategy at Dexas. What, what's, uh, what's like unique about your guys' approach and kind of what is the overall smart building strategy? Well, I think I've indicated that we, we kind of don't buy shiny things unless they've got a really, really good value. Uh -huh. It's about value proposition, right? Everything that we do is underpinned by minimum value proposition. Okay. Um, so my strategy is a, a more around a, building a foundation to digitize the portfolio. Okay. Um, so it's about connectivity, uh, networking, good standards of cyber, trying to stay out of proprietary world, looking at open source, and getting to a point where we've got a digitized portfolio that we can start to then gain some real insights and some power from. Okay. I kind of have seen a lot of people buying apps before they bought the smartphone. That kind of makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it's about building up that smartphone foundation. Yeah. So okay. one of the first things I did was to start writing our technology standards for all of our primary systems. Okay. And that was to create consistency and also to then look at, does that open up opportunities for economies of scale? procurement strategies yeah yeah so there's a lot of stuff that we're doing is kind of like in, in the back end at the moment yeah i'm um, preparing for what's coming for the future and that's because i don't think really everybody i don't think the industry is ready to really start to invest in a huge portfolio thing at the moment mm -hmm. because it's too fast moving and i think that if we did invest in something we might not get the power out of the product because of maybe the data sets aren't ready totally and that's from my learning of that, that, as I said, working with that, those tech guys, my learning about it's all about infrastructure and data. Totally. Without that, nothing else can, can happen. And have you guys gone down the road of the sort of, like you said, point solution app before? I love that analogy. App, you, you bought the app before the smartphone. Have you guys gone down the app point solution sort of uh, mindset or like with pilot projects and then realized that it wasn't scalable or... No, look, we got we got a couple of apps we use, but they they're third party vendor apps, and to be honest with you, the customers love them. It's not doing things like you know you can adjust your air conditioning and all that sort of stuff. It's more of a community app that brings customers together, and it's messaging. You know, they they it's all about we we we've got a, a team that obviously um, look at customer feedback. We're very very um, big on talking to our customers about what they would like and and what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. And feedback's been that where there's a building with an app, yeah, they say it's great. It's it's a way of us connecting with, you know, the things that are happening around the building and in the building. So things like, you know, end of trip and events and things like that. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, we, we've got a couple of apps that we use. And and we've also got our, um, we've got a big instance of SkySpark running across the portfolio, which helps us to keep up with our fault detection optimization. Cool. 
okay. something that we rolled out quite a few years ago. Cool. And is that across the whole portfolio that you're doing that? Primarily office. Okay. Has got it. We've got a bit of fault detection in retail, but it's a different product. And we've got a couple of different models across the portfolio. So it's the same platform, but we're using two different vendors. And the reason behind that was that they have different approaches. And for us, we were trying to work out, is there one approach that does everything or do we need two, two different approaches to give us what we want? And I did that when I was consulting and Vexus were a client. Um, so about five or six years ago. And we're at a stage now where we're just looking at, okay, so what does V2 look like? And it's, uh, we're just starting on that journey. All right. I'd love to hear what these first five years were like. How have you integrated the analytics into workflows to get stuff done? Um, and then have you used a centralized model or has it been more distributed? Have you leaned on the vendor? How have you sort of implemented the FDD? So the first thing that I had to do was work out what was in the buildings and actually could it provide information to the FDD in the first place. <laughs> okay. So there was a bunch of surveys that were done. Okay. And out the back of that, across the two vendors, we had to have two or three different mechanisms to get information out just yeah. because the legacy systems are in the building. That speaks to your strategy on getting the infrastructure right first. That's right. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So we had a two or three mechanisms. You know, some were we were fortunate enough that we could just plug a box in and get the information out. Mm -hmm. Others were using emailed, you know, CSVs and all sorts of things. Anyway, we could get the information. So that was the first challenge. Yeah. Um, and then pretty much we, it was down to the vendors to, to deploy it back then. Um, those guys went in and did what they needed to do in the buildings. They got the platform running. And stage one was just to get fault detection operating and see what it could do for us. Okay. I think that, yeah. Now we started collecting the stats. And because, like I was saying to you previously, we weren't really sure of the value. We thought it had value. Yeah. But we were a very early adopter back then. I think we were the first in Australia to do it. Okay. And so we were kind of being a bit cautious about, you know, um, does this thing really have value? Okay. And absolutely, absolutely it does. It's like, you know, it, it's it's probably one of the, it should be now a standard tool set on all buildings, this, this fault detection. So it goes into our vendors' environments. And then one mechanism is that they both report back to our ops teams about um, faults and and uh, what they found that they can optimize. Okay. And it's helped us, out, helped us out with our maintenance and it's helped us out with some forecasting as well because of it's starting to tell us, you know, we have some problems with some equipment that aren't going to go away and we'll need to do a replacement. Okay. And one of the hardest things for us is our, is our forecasting. Cool. Okay. For our capex. Is there, I, I've heard people talk about this value. Do you guys, is there like a business case to do that? Do you actually save money by, by more intelligent planning? My gut is that you do. It's really hard to quantify. Hard to quantify. Yeah. But okay. things that you can really put your, you can put money to is when, so as an example, if fault detection picks up that something's running when it shouldn't, maybe it's running all weekend or a long weekend because of maybe either through a fault or through manual intervention or somebody's forgotten to take it out of manual, mm -hmm. there is a direct relation to a cost impact and energy impact to that. Yeah. So when, you, when it's related to energy, it's very easy to kind of quantify. Mm -hmm. When it's other things, it's a little, little bit harder to quantify. Very cool. What's the, the next version two look like? Or what's the, what's the strategy behind the, the next round? The fault detection analytics at the moment is very focused on, if you like, HVAC or, or building. It's within the building box. Mm -hmm. We're looking at you need to start combining those data sets with other corporate operational information. Okay. So I think it's, it's proper portfolio analytics that brings numerous data sets into it okay. rather than just it's our building and then other there's our corporate yeah so inside the building are you expanding beyond hvac too and and yeah. then when you get up to the enterprise level what what other data streams are you talking about access control lifts um you name it uh -huh. i think that everything in a building that's got the ability to provide information we need to look at it and there will be certain data sets we'd extract not all data sets though mm -hmm. i think there's a it's very easy just to say we'll have everything, but I think we need to realize that when you start pushing data to the cloud, there's also another cost that kicks in. Storage has become much more affordable these days, but with the use of APIs and starting to draw on the data sets, once you start to ask data questions, that's when the, the, the taxi uh, clock starts to tick, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we have, to be, we have to be mindful of the operating cost of the technology, not just the, the CapEx cost of putting it in. Yeah, I hear, I hear people talk about that sometimes and I hear other ones saying, oh, the cloud is democratized, the cloud is so cheap. And it's like, well, sort of. <laughs> yeah, sort of. Uh, yeah. Cool. And, and what do you think the business case will be then to take 
basically take analytics up to that next level? What, what will that mean for the you know, organization? I think the business case is kind of there because we've been on our corporate side, we've been playing with data sets for quite a long time. We've got some very, very smart cookies working in Dexas, very, very smart, and they're able to extract all sorts of information. So I think that they already understand data really is the center of their world at the moment to help them with their operations, mm -hmm. whether that be financial, leasing, whatever, it doesn't really matter. It's all about information. Mm -hmm. So I think that bringing our buildings up to that level as well is just a natural thing that needs to happen. And I think that the business case is almost like it makes sense yeah. to do that. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I think that the, particularly when you start talking about the efficiencies that we can gain, you know, bringing in better procurement processes, economy of scale, forecasting, running things on more of a reliability index rather than a, than a monthly visit index. I think that we go towards, I did a project quite a few years ago using a Monte Carlo simulation, which was looking at reliability indexing of equipment. Okay. And the theory was, if you've got a bit of equipment that's, that can run for a thousand hours without any problems, don't go maintain it. Go and have a look at the 950 hours sort of thing, you know, very high level where these errors going from. Uh -huh. And then there's another one where they were saying it's actually cheaper to buy a standby piece of equipment six months before you think it's going to fail and go and maintain it. Now, very progressive, very out there, uh -huh. but you kind of understand the theory behind it. Yeah. So the ability to start rethinking the way that maintenance happens across the whole portfolio is kind of where you're headed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, literally using the data for the maintenance and intelligent maintenance, I would call it, rather than just your, your routine. Mm -hmm. And the interesting piece about that is that we've looked at how can we reduce maintenance? And there are some things that you cannot reduce having truck call for because there's compliance. Okay. So we, we went through a whole matrix of what are the activities that happens during maintenance? And there's a number of them where you have to send somebody to site for compliance issues. Like what would be an example? Oh, uh, looking at things like, anything to do with water, pipe, condensers, you know, things like that. And then it's like, if you've got to send someone to site, you can't send them to site just to do a five minute exercise of inspecting something and tagging it. So while they're there, they might as well do other things. And those other things would have been the things that you would have said they don't need to go to site and do. So it's a real balancing yeah. act. Right? Yeah. yeah. I heard a couple of thought leaders, nothing published yet, but people talk, you know, telling me about how they're thinking about this. Sometimes I've heard, you know, do your preventative maintenance, but while you're there, fix those three or four or five faults that popped up, like things like that. But I don't think, I don't think we've gotten to a point where there is an accepted or like future state that we're all trying to get to in that respect. Um, from no. my perspective is we're like, let's analyze data, let's find faults. And we're not at a point as an industry where we're like, we know exactly what to do with the faults once we get them. Is that, is that kind of how yeah. you're seeing things too? Yeah, and I remember when we first put the, um, the fault detection in, we were watching the amount of faults that we found and the, the OPEX cost to fix the faults. And you're in like a bit of a bell curve for a while that this thing is finding things that we didn't know were a problem <laughs> and they yeah. do need to be fixed. And until things settle down, you, you've got a bit of an uphill battle for, for the first few months of it going live. Yeah. Yeah. Hey guys, just another quick note from our sponsor, Nexus Labs, and then we'll get back to the show. This episode is brought to you by Nexus Foundations, our introductory course on the smart buildings industry. If you're new to the industry, this course is for you. If you're an industry vet but want to understand how technology is changing things, this course is also for you. The alumni are raving about the content, which they say pulls it all together. And they also love getting to meet the other students on the weekly Zoom calls and in the private chat room. You can find out more about the course at courses.nexuslabs.online. All right, back to the interview. How do you think we get to that point as an industry where when we have a list of faults, we have like streamlined processes and automations to get them into workflows, such as, you know, the O&M staff, you know, external service providers. Do you, how do you, where do you see that going? I think that will come in time. I think that if you look at automation in factories and process plants, they've got that pretty much down now. I think the technology is there. I just think that people have certain processes in their organizations and it's a bit of a difficult shift for them. It's a mindset thing. Yeah. I, I've, I've seen automated work orders before in other industries. I think the thing that's missing from the analytics is, the, is what I call the fat data. So the fat data is about, it's the intellect of the person that's looking at it. So a machine may say to you, oh, I've looked at this and I've looked at that and I think the problem is here. 
but a human may look at it and go, well, actually, I can understand your thinking, but on my experience, the problem is actually over here. Yeah. And that's the fat, fat data, right? Yeah. So I think there's still so much human triaging that happens in fault detection. It's very difficult to automate a workflow because you could be really yeah. out. <laughs> so I think and still, until you can get that machine learning to be very, very accurate, mm-hmm. I think that's when you'll really start to see the full workflow automation happening. Yeah, this is a this is a place where I feel like there's there's two types of innovation that's needed. One is with the data you have, come up with the best root cause that's possible with the data, right? I feel like there's a lot of analytics firms that that only go a portion of the way on that spectrum, right? They're going to give you kind of a shitty piece of analysis, in my opinion. And they're like, here, human, deal with this, right? But then there's some analytics providers that get you further along, right? But I feel like the next piece, which is like white space, as far as I know, I haven't seen any vendors doing this. Happy to get about 20 emails after this gets published uh, of all the people that that are doing this. But what I haven't seen yet is when I give the human the analytics and then they go make a decision, there's a shit ton of data there that happens, right? Um, They acknowledge it or they delete it or they go change the rule that came up with it because it wasn't right. They go dig into the controls drawings to figure out, you know, like, well, actually your tagging or your modeling was wrong. And so the, the, and then you get into the implementation, right? Uh, that was a loose set screw or that actually, you know, that piece of equipment doesn't even have a valve. <laughs> you, you get yes. into all that stuff, right? And I feel like there's a ton of data there that we don't have that's currently not digital that we could be using. And I feel like that's like the next frontier to making actions more reliable or recommended actions more reliable what do you yeah think? and it's a problem because of i guess it goes back to standards again mm-hmm. right? i mean one of the things why i wanted to get these standards written was that if i go to 10 consultants i'll get 10 flavors of controls for my hvac system and those hvac systems could all be vav could all be chill beam doesn't really matter what it is but i will have variations upon a theme and yet hvac is all based upon um, physics right mm-hmm. you can't change physics and yeah. psychometrics so the, the fundamentals of HVAC are all set on some standards. Yet yeah. There are these opinionated control strategies that tweak, and, and some of them are, are really, really good. And this is no kind of like disrespect to anybody in the industry, but some of them are great, some of them not so great, but they're just different. Yeah. So now you went to try and apply some standard rule sets. It becomes a challenge because you almost have to reinvent the wheel every time yeah. to understand the control algorithms that are working within the building and then adapt your rule sets to make sense of them. Yeah, super interesting. I, that's the third frontier that comes first is like, and I think when I had um, Trevor and Keith from Google on the podcast last winter, mm-hmm. they talked about creating those sorts of standards in, in, in terms of like, we will only accept these types of HVAC systems in our buildings and these control sequences, you know, that that comes upstream to the FDD, right? Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree. Yeah, yeah. So we, we've written within our briefs now of how we want things controlled to try and standardize on that because when the really the new world of really powerful ai comes along we don't want to have to have very complex implementation at every single building because yeah. obviously the business case is harder to justify with the amount of cost of deployment absolutely well I, I challenge the industry again if anyone's doing ai on the implementation of the fault data the interaction between humans and the investigation that goes into it, reach out to me. I want to hear about it. All right. What about like non-FDD types of technology deployments? Um, I know you guys are doing, you know, obviously just announced this Atlassian headquarters project, but then you've also done several other kind of smart building prototypes, pilots, whatever you want to call them as well. So what have you learned from from those projects, any, any good stories there? I think probably the, the good one to talk about is the gateway building with the where we you know, integrated the, the hand scanning biometrics into the access control. Mm-hmm. I think there's seven technologies that we have to pull together in that building. Cool. And I'll just jump to the results first of all. Great project. It took a lot of, of uh, organizing and a lot of collaboration between the whole team. Mm-hmm. between the integrator and, and all the other vendors involved in the project proves that you can do it and get a great outcome, but a complex journey, a cool. very detailed, complex journey. So with that building, it was going through a lobby refurbishment. It's the gateway building in Sydney. One of the customers in there was um, security conscious and wanted speed gates to go in. And as you know, once you put speed gates in, that impacts on everybody, you know, all other customers, visitors. So we had to think, 
okay, we'll put the gates in, but can we make this a nicer experience for everybody? What could we do to get around the, the typical kind of get your access card out and tap and everything else? Okay. Because it was a lobby upgrade, we were also refurbishing the lifts. So it was an opportunity to converge several projects into one technology. And actually, there were some efficiencies in doing that, which is one of our strategies going forward as well, um, which I can talk to you about in a minute if you like. It was about the convergence of projects to create efficiencies. So with Gateway, um, yeah, we'd, we'd already trialed the, the, the hand scanners and the feedback was pretty good on one of our other buildings. So we knew that adoption would be okay. Just on that, we were very unsure about using cameras for um, facial recognition. Don't really think it's 100% accurate. And even if it's at 97% accurate, you're going to get some false positives, Yeah, which is not a great experience, right? So, hmm. and then there's the perception piece. I don't think people really like having cameras on them all the time. Yeah. And it's a, I think it's a, it's a use case, right? If you go to an airport, it's kind of expected. When you go into a commercial office, it's not really expected. So it's about perception. So we're a bit concerned about that. So it was a few things. It was security, perception, accuracy that led us down to the hand scanner path. And they are highly accurate. Speed is fantastic mm -hmm. and quite simple to integrate at that level. Okay. And they also give you the choice of um, access cards as well. They've got a card reader on them as well. So we're not saying you can only use your hands. We're saying that you have choices. And I think this is a fundamental. When we start to talk about technology that's customer facing, it's about choice. It's not about dictation to bring them on the journey too. So we integrated the, the hand scanners into the, into the gates, the gates into the destination control system. That was also integrated into the car park management system, so the boom gates, so the ski data system down in the basement, the end of trip access and locker management system, and also the bike rack storage area. So as a customer in the building, if you're enrolled on the system, you can literally go from street to tenancy without touching anything by just passing your hand under a it actually it's a bit you i mean i'm happy for you to share the video um because it's public but it's if you have a look at it carefully you actually don't need to touch anything it looks, it looks like you are but you're not you're just waving your hand through a, so it's a really cool story that it, we, we managed to pull it off and and the best story is customers love it it's you know yeah um but the, the challenge was seven technologies seven different kind of types of protocols seven different types of connectivity mm -hmm. we were lucky that we had you know I'm not going to do much of a plug, but Honeywell were the main kind of guys in the building had their security system. Okay. They had a pretty good team on site. And so through a lot of collaboration, we managed to get all these systems to talk and share and pass data very quickly. That's what it was all about. I was very worried about the, the latency. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because if you think about it, when you push your hand, think about the chain effect of the hand scanner, recognizes you're out in the building, passes it to the lift, access control. It's very, very fast. So what does the architecture of this look like? Uh, if, if I'm picturing like a, a typical, all these systems are in their own silos, there's multiple levels to each system. What does the architecture of this look like? Um, I'll try and remember it from, so from scanner to access control, it's actually acting a bit like a card. It's over IP, okay. but it can also um, issue um, the WAGAN signal. So you can make it act just like it's reading a card. Okay. It just your hand is your card. From the IP infrastructure, it goes into the Honeywell EBI system. And the Honeywell EBI system is pretty much orchestrating between destination control, okay. um, C data system, and they had to write some custom scripts to make it all work pretty quickly. And there was a bit they had to write to integrate the IDEMIA management system, so the hand scanning enrollment system, okay. into, into their platform um, to make it all come together. So there was quite a lot of coding involved, a bit of testing, it's quite a lot of work. Yeah. We tried that. We need to try something else. But uh -huh. great project. Love right. part of it. So how do you think about then taking that to other buildings? It sounds like it, it was kind of, you know, bespoke a little bit um, for that one. 100%. Yeah. And one thing I would add is that the most complex piece to get right was the integration of the visitor management. Okay. We had to create a load of different personas of who's going to come in the building and when, what access will they need to work out how to get that visitor piece to work just as well as if you're enrolled in the system. But to get to your point about um, rolling out to the buildings, scalability is a real problem because mm -hmm. of we can take the philosophy to our other buildings, we could use the hand scanners, but we'll probably have different flavors of technology within those buildings. So therefore we have to start the integration process again. Right. So commercial viability and timelines start to yeah, throw a few challenges up to scale well, it out. And then in some cases, like you wouldn't even have the Honeywell guys under the next building, right? Yeah, sure. And, even, and, you know, think of this way, even if we did, they'll have different access control or they could have different lifts. Yeah. 
super interesting. Cool. So while we're talking about sort of scale, how are you thinking about as you sort of pilot and sort of converge? Well, you mentioned convergence. So why don't we talk about convergence first? Uh, and then maybe it relates to scale, but I want to hear about how you're kind of thinking about scaling up different use cases. You mentioned convergence of projects. What do you, what do you mean by that? So um, we carried out a technology audit to work out all the technology across predominantly the office portfolio and where it sat in its life cycle. Mm -hmm. And there were a few things that came out of that. And, and the process that we went through is I created an online questionnaire. There weren't many questions that were um, free for people to populate. They were pretty much, um, I dictated the answers they could choose from. The reason I did that is because of when we started to digitize the, the information, I could create a really fast dashboard of what was coming up towards end of life, what, what had been recently replaced. Okay. Um, so it was a really good starting point for me when I first came into into Texas to understand what am I playing with. Um, but you know, the benefit out of that was that maybe we've got an opportunity now to look at our forecasting. So we can understand when technology is going to come up for replacement. Maybe it's not full replacement, maybe it's partial, but we can start to plan out maybe a five-year you know, um, forecast of what's happening. Mm -hmm. What I started to say though was that there were things like CCTV upgrades that had been planned. Yeah. And there were also BMS upgrades that had been planned. And they were maybe a year to 18 months apart. So they would fall in different financial years. And what would traditionally happen is they would be dealt with within those financial years and they'd be almost siloed projects. So I looked at, well, if I know that the BMS can last another 18 months and it's not a high risk for us, can I move that? And can I then use the CCTV upgrade from analog to IP cameras to create an integrated communications network for the BMS to use? Yeah. And that's what I mean by converging those projects to get, again, economies of scale, get the best um, out of the combining those projects together. That was yeah, one of the strategies that we're, we're trialing. And with a, a couple of projects have gone past and been really successful, worked really, really well. Just, just different, just a different way of thinking about things. And I, I think that's what's kind of like, I know I've got this word smart in my title, and I think I'm, I'm not sure whether I was 100% comfortable with it, but I think it's not about technology. I think it's about being smart with your money, smart with you know tech, yeah. smart with process. I, I love that because people, when people talk about convergence and knocking down silos, a lot of times they're like complaining about the construction process a little bit. But then you yes. go ahead and do all the replacements for those same silos and silos. So that, that's awesome. Very cool. Yeah. So where do you think we're at? Like, I'm finding myself wanting like some sort of like therapy from you, John, right now. Like, <laughs> like where are we at? Like, of all the things you guys are doing, you know, building new buildings, operating them. You've been at this from so many different lenses, right? Where are we at right now as an industry? And like, what's still holding us back from getting to smart? <laughs> Your favorite word. That's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> I think the industry is in a little bit of state of confusion at the moment, if I'm really honest mm. about yeah. it. Okay. It's moving so fast. It's a problem for people to keep up with, with things. You know, I was talking to you previously about it's very challenging in a construction environment because of it's locked down to time and processes. And it could be a five year build. And in five years' time, what you bought is now out of date. So I think that there's a real challenge there. And I think the industry is bit of a waiting game that's going on hmm. okay i think if i kind of you know relate it to, to maybe you know an australian theme think about surfing right okay the industry's out on the waves and there's a few catching some the odd waves here or there and they're going forward but they eventually come back to where the waves are mm -hmm. and i think there's a lot of people waiting for that big wave to all get on it together and all go you know yeah and i think that wave is getting closer and closer I reckon within five years, you'll see a lot more standardization in practices and the ability to deploy tech seem more seamlessly than it is at the moment. So I think that we're right at this point in time now where there's a big thing coming. <laughs> it's yeah. been talked about for a long time and I can actually see it in the distance. Yeah. So for organizations like you guys, then focusing on that data enablement infrastructure layer is kind of like getting ready to catch the big wave. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And future proofing, you know, it's as much as you possibly can. Where do you sit? I want to, I want to do like a little rapid fire round real quick on a couple of different things uh, before we, before we do two truths and a lie real quick at the end, where do you sit on ontologies, right? So you're, you're thinking about data enablement and you, you mentioned standards a couple of times. Where, where do you, how, how do you guys approach ontologies at Texas? It's quite new to be honest with you for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we have one at a corporate level. So we've ran out a program over the last few years to digitize our corporate operations. Okay. That's using a version of an ontology. So we need one, full stop, right? You've got to have one. 
if you don't have one, you won't get the power out of all the information that you collect. Yeah. I'm not sure about how the industry is going to adopt which ontology and whether they all serve a purpose for different things. Mm-hmm. So whether there be different flavors for different outcomes. Yeah. I don't know whether we've gone backwards a bit where we're now in the back net versus long kind of world of, is it haystack, is it brick? Yeah. Or is it both? Or is it a combination? You know, I think it's a watch this space time at the moment. Well, ontology, absolutely. They're opinionated and you just have to have your opinion of what works for you, I think, at the moment. And, you know, I was doing a, an industry session yesterday where um, one of the guys from Google was a keynote and that's pretty much was his message anyway. Hmm. He was saying that, you know, um, just have one, <laughs> but have one <laughs> that works for you. I actually was thinking that was the, the main message. So we will have one that works for us. Absolutely. Okay, cool. Second rapid fire question. Where do you feel about, so you talked about analytics, you know, one way pulling the data to the enterprise. How do you feel about two way? How do you feel about supervisory control and the new types of startups you guys probably get approached by all the time? Yes, is my answer. It has to happen. Okay, why? Whether we're ready for it right now, yeah. um, the year is out. I don't think that the, again, it's the data structure Yeah. and it's the learning. I don't think, I think there's too much human interaction required to make decisions at the moment. Totally. But it's definitely coming. Let's close this with two truths and a lie. And I, I told you before we hit record that I have a hundred percent record so far in case anyone, in case no one's noticed, we're, we're <laughs> going to put that to the test. Okay. Let's, let's um, hear it. So um, my 18th birthday was pretty interesting. I was the only one that wasn't at my party. I used to teach windsurfing, but I can't windsurf. <laughs> oh, these are great. All right, cool. And I did a wing walk for charity. What's a wing walk? What is that? Uh, you stand on the, on, the, on the wings of a biplane. It's like on a frame. You stand on a frame. You built, built it in, obviously, on okay. the top of a biplane. And then you fly around for yeah, 15 minutes. I think that one's a lot. 100%. All right. All right. Those are good ones. Tell me about this 18th birthday party real quick. <laughs> so I, I started my career in Petrochem. And my boss came to me one occasion and said to me, I've got some good news and some bad news. And I said, um, well, what's the good news? I have that first. He said, um, I want to send you to the Caribbean to do a field trip. And I said, what's the bad news? He said, it's on your birthday. <laughs> so, and un- unbeknown to me, my friends had organized my 18th. And it was a secret. Um, and, they were all, and, they, and, and they didn't know that I'd gone off to the Caribbean. <laughs> <laughs> so they're like calling you, like, come over for pizza or whatever. And then <laughs> you never answered. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Very well prepared. I, lo- I love those those three prompts. So thank you for that. And thank you for coming on the show. I really appreciate you having me. That's good. That's been great. Right. It's, uh, yeah, it's been fun. All right, friends. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Nexus Podcast. For more episodes like this and to get the weekly Nexus newsletter, which, by the way, readers have said is the best way to stay up to date on the future of the smart building industry, please subscribe at nexuslabs.online. You can find the show notes for this conversation there as well. Have a great day. Thank you.